Hey, we're back on. And uh, while he's getting his mic on, we have Brock Pierce here with us. Um, uh, doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll still give him one. You guys know him, uh, one, as a, as a pioneer in the space, uh, Bitcoin Foundation, the first security token ever. Uh, so, so many, you know, digital collectibles at the very, very beginning and all the things that you know him for that we've had conversations in previous versions of this event uh, with, with him. But now we got something we probably never would have guessed, uh, we would have, you know, said, presidential candidate. So, uh, Brock, welcome. Thank you for being here. I know you're in the middle of a crazy schedule, so thanks for joining us. Yeah, well, I'm <laughs> glad to be here. I've been supporting you for a long time. I think, um, well, it started when I, I filled in for Tim Draper. That was such. A, that's a great story. Uh, we we got to hit that really quick. So we did our first Crowd Invest Summit ever, which must have been maybe five years ago now or something like that. It was it was a while ago, and Tim uh, was supposed to be the opening keynote. I was going to do like a fireside chat with him or something. And literally the morning of, Tim called me. And Tim's not the type of person to call. He usually would send an email and he's really fast, but he called me because he's like, I'm so sorry, I'm sick. I can't make it. Who can we get to take my spot? And he started making suggestions and he's like, I'm gonna text Brock, he'd be awesome. Do you know Brock, you gotta connect. And then Brock came and we had a great fireside chat. You were talking a lot about crypto, about all, all this innovative stuff. And most of the people in the audience, including me, didn't know at what you were talking about because it was, you know, we're, we're a very crowdfunding crowd. So it's all FinTech and crowdfunding. And the funniest thing was after the event, uh, Tim started getting emails from random people saying, I was at the event, Tim, you were amazing. <laughs> and he was sending us these messages. And, you know, if you guys know Tim, he's a big dude, big eyebrows, big hair, you know, like, you know that it's Tim. And, and Brock, blonde guy, very different looking, right? So like you see, if they were next to each other, they look so different. So it's just such a funny uh, situation. And we had a lot of fun uh, just in that conversation afterwards. But um, I, I remember that conversation turned into all, it basically like, you know, I remember them going to Venice and you telling us about this thing called a security token. And you were telling us about how you were gonna launch a security token, or you're gonna pick the regulator, of, you know, and we we're, we we're talking about that and it was so far ahead of its time. So, you know, I, I uh, can't wait to hear your, your feelings and what you're going through right now, because it's always, you know, it's always very, very, uh, you know, ahead. And so thank you again for, for all of your support over the years and being a part of this. Um, I actually, so for everyone watching too, I'm keeping the, uh, most of these chats were in a separate thing, but I'm keeping the chat uh, live on my screen. So I can see if you guys ask questions for Brock so I can throw some of them his way. Um, but I, I just, let's start with what's going on right now. I mean, uh, you're, you've been making headlines. Yeah, well, I'm running for president <laughs> of the United States of America. And so um, I guess the first, piece of advice I would encourage all of you to have anytime someone tells you they're running for a political office. Well, it's the same thing anytime someone, I guess, is pitching you a business idea. Um, you know, any of the things that we're looking at. Amber, there we go. Oh, so, boom. There we go. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm technical, so I can troubleshoot problems too. <laughs> Wait, a, pres a presidential candidate that could also work the computer. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean you, think in age, you think in this day and age, considering how big a role technology plays in the world, that this is a skill set that we would want in our leaders. You know, we'd like them to understand what's going on in the world, have their finger on the pulse. I mean, we've got artificial intelligence coming online, robotics, automation, jobs changing, everything's changing. Look at how social networking is affecting our democracy. I mean, it's embarrassing when we watch our tech leaders testify before our government. I mean, the quality of the questions being asked. And then that also affects, you know, the, the, the impact and the quality of the regulators and the work that they're doing. And so, I mean, I definitely think we need some visionary leadership that understands technology. Um, but let's take a step back. So I'm <laughs> running for president of the United States of America. And so the question we should always ask of candidates or anyone with an idea pitching any of these things is, is why are you doing that? 
question why. So tell us. I can summarize why I'm running for office in one word. Love. At a time where so many of us feel like our choices are fear and hate, at a time where the United States feels like the divided states, we have to find a path forward to unification. I mean, we're divided right now politically, racially, economically, while at the same time we're facing existential threats environmentally, technologically, pandemically, uh, issues with foreign nations, um, uh, China in particular. I mean, it's like, it's scary. Like, I think we're doomed if we don't do something different. The status quo is not working. It feels like we're a frog being, being boiled, you know, in water that's being, you know, warmed up slowly. And I'm just looking at our freedoms and I'm looking at our economy and looking at everything. And it's just like, stop, stop. This is something wrong. I feel it. I see it. And I'm stepping up to do something about it. I'm stepping up to like point out issues, to present ideas that are different than those that you're hearing about, actually addressing the stuff that no politician will normally even talk about. And so I think we have to find a way out of this. And I think that there are answers. We have a lot of problems right now, but innovation is the answer to our problems. We have 21st century solutions to our 21st century problems, but I don't see any vision. I don't see any like, here's the goal. Here's the destination for our nation. Like, here's where we got to go. I don't see that. I mean, I, the debates the other night were, um, I mean, they were so deep. I mean, the depth of the policy discussions there, I mean, it was nothing short of enlightening. Um, and the dignity and the respect of the, the quality of leadership. I mean, it wasn't even presidential. I mean, it was like, it was regal. Uh, <laughs> like no matter, it's no, what, no matter who wins, it's, it's like, you just know America's going to win. There was, I mean, the vision for our future and, and, and the confidence and the, ins the inspiration that 2030 is going to be okay. Everything could be great. Um, <laughs> seriously, uh, it's like, <laughs> It's offensive yeah. though. Like I were laughing, but I'm like, I, I'm like, I, so I'm in my background, I'm like a punk rocker, right? I grew up in, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I grew up in this world where, where one, I was exactly 18 years old when 9-11 happened. It was literally like my first semester of being out of the house, right? I went to school and I'm a punk rocker, but half of my friends go to join the military. My other half of my friends go extreme opposite direction, right? And like, and what's crazy is that look at both sides of the political spectrum claiming to be something so different from each other, but the people who are on the democratic side would have easily been pretty much exactly the same as the Republicans I hated back then. Now the Republicans have gone so far that direction. And then the thing is there's no gray area. There's no conversations. Like I can't tell a friend that I agree on one subject that somebody says without saying, you know, that I can agree with some other subject somebody says, because I'm a traitor. And it's so weird because like, I don't know if you grew up, like I, I joke that I grew up in a house of Israelis and I don't, I can't like, if I argue with someone, it's the people I agree with the most. Like, that's how you know I'm, I, I agree with you. I'm arguing with you over something, right? And it's like, you go to the dinner table, you argue about politics, you argue about, you know, all sorts of things. And then you love the person at the end of the night. Right? Like you, you throw your arm around them, you give them a kiss and, and you move on because, and the only reason why you're fighting and arguing is because you're passionate and you love each other. And it's like so different now. Like if you even suggest one thing that, that could, you know, trigger somebody or something. And I don't mean that in a, in the kind of way people are arguing about, you know, snowflake thing nowadays, but like, it's just weird that there is no gray area. You can't be like, oh yeah, I'm like, for example, all of the things that it's, uh, you know, uh, most of the social things people are saying, you know, should be done on one side of the aisle, I think are inherently human rights. But I also truly believe that there's not one government official that could actually execute on that, on any of those plans. So like, it's, it's weird. So do you vote for the person who says the right thing, even though you know there's no chance in hell it will ever happen? I, it's so I, think the, I think the answer is that is exactly what you do. 
I think we have a major problem in this country that we don't have compassion and patience for people we disagree with. You know, we should be able to sit down at a table and have a conversation. And at the end of that conversation, we should be able to agree to disagree, but know through that process that we understand the other person's perspective. And through that understanding, we can then find compromise. We can find a path forward. The fact that we are not able to have conversations, we're not even able to have opinions. Like you were saying, if you agree with this one thing, all of a sudden you're a traitor, but no, I'm, I'm trying to talk about an issue. And I think that maybe because neither side is all right or all wrong, right? They're both wrong and they're both right. It, well, especially <laughs> in this polarizing, crazy media world that we're in, like you have to go extreme, you know, like it's, it's, and what people say and what they do are so extremely different too, you know, like we live in uh, in a great state, or I, I live in a great state. I don't know where, where you are full time anymore because uh, you're all over the place. But like, I live in California. I love California. But two of our greatest cities, LA and San Francisco, have great like the worst homeless problems that they've ever had. And the politicians running both places are have said nothing but the right thing in terms of we're going to fight to end this. We're going to do everything we can to stop this but it's only gotten worse, you know? So like, it's, it's, it's really, really hard. Um, it's Albert hard. Einstein is credited with this line that, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. You know, that's what it feels like, left, right, left, right, left, right, but it feels like we're just going in circles. It actually feels more like we're in a downward spiral. And so it's time that we wake up to the reality that we need to vote our conscience. Don't buy into this lesser of two evil stuff. You know, that's what they keep telling you every election. Oh, this one's really important. So, you know, you got to do this. And, and next time we can do what we think is right. We can do what we believe is right. We can vote for candidates we believe are right. No, no. We need to do what we believe in our hearts is the right thing to do. It matters more when it comes to the system of governance than anything else. This is the system that governs over us, that was meant to be there in service to us. You know, we don't allow uh, our family members to operate without integrity, to lie, cheat, steal, miss, you know, th these things are, that's, we require that in our family, that we require that with our friends. We even require that with most of our colleagues, at least the people we do business with over the long run. So why in the world would we allow that type of behavior to exist in the system that governs over us? Hey, it's man, because it's politics. We, but that's the problem is it's I not know. just politics. It is a system of governance that governs over us. We cannot continue to allow this to happen. What they do is it's the left and right wing of the same bird. And they keep tricking us into believing we only have two choices, which is a lie. It is an illusion. 43% of eligible voters are not voting. 38% of registered voters will be registered as independents by 2024. 70% of Democrats and Republicans are unhappy with their party. They are the minority. We are the silent majority that have been tricked into not voting our conscience and not doing what we know to be right. The path forward is in the middle. It's where, where's that common sense where both parties can have some right and some wrong? Where is that moderate section in the middle? Common sense, sensible thinking. We're there. We are the majority. And the moment that we realize that we have all of the power, we can change it all. The future is going to happen to you or it's going to happen with you. So let's get involved and create a future that we all want to live in. And so I'm 39 years old. I turn 40 next month in November. So this is the beginning. I'm laying the foundation for the future. And this is not about me. This is about creating a political movement, an uprising, a revolution of sorts to create a government of, for, and by the people where we get candidates into office who are there to directly represent the constituents that elected them, 
free from the control of political parties. On November 4th, I am looking for 100 candidates to run up and down the ticket in 2022. 100 candidates, preferably that are not career politicians, doctors, teachers, business people, entrepreneurs, artists, athletes, scientists, engineers, whatever. People that are prepared to serve a government of, for, and by the people. We need some diversity. And so I'm building the infrastructure, not only for my presidential run, but for you. So I invite you, I encourage you to ask yourself, are you ready to stand up and to do something? Our future depends on it. The fate, not only of this nation, but the fate of humanity will be determined by the decisions we make over the course of this next decade. This is the ultimate sacrifice. I am stepping into the ring of fire, prepared to lose everything I have, to give up everything I've earned, potentially even my life, because that is what is at stake right now. I am a father of two young girls. What kind of world are we going to leave behind for the generation that follows us? Will it be a world that they can survive in? Will there even be a world left for them? And if we do our job correctly, it could be a world they thrive in. And now is the time. It is the 11th hour. It's time for us to get involved and it starts with registering to vote, voting your conscience. I don't care who you vote for, but vote and vote for what you believe to be right. Do not allow fear to make the decisions for you. That is the tool of the parties to prevent you from doing what you are supposed to do. Dude, so I'm 1,000% one, 1, believe everyone should vote and I want everyone to vote and I want everyone to, to be able to say that they exercise the right to vote because you can't, it's hard to really justify complaining about something you refuse to participate in. So, so there's that, right? But I also feel like it's the entrepreneur in me, maybe it's what drove me to crypto and, and, and startups and all that stuff, right? Like there is the feeling of like, why participate in this broken thing? Why not burn it to the ground and start over? Why not do, skip this? Let's leapfrog this, go straight to digital jurisdictions. Let's go no borders, no nations. Screw it all. Let's just start fresh, uh, you know, and, and you, uh, you know, knowing your background, you're, you are crazy enough probably to go that route too. Um, so, so I would love to hear your feelings of, you know, why get into the mix of this already broken system versus like, let's, let's come up with something totally brand new. So there's two ways to go. The path that you just described is going to be full of chaos and it's going to involve the loss of a lot of lives. And I don't know how that's going to go. The alternative is that yes, the system is broken, but it's not all bad. Let's take it over. Let's begin to fix it and let's upgrade it. Let's upgrade the operating system of the United States of America. Let's create America 2.0, incorporating the ideas that you're talking about. That is an evolutionary event. This is the path that is ideal, which is why I'm doing this. I promise you burning it all to the ground is not going to be a pretty picture. Taking over the system and thoughtfully fixing it and making the necessary changes to upgrade it, I think, is the far better route. But, you know, I'm biased, obviously, as someone running for office and involved in this. But as someone that's been on the forefront of these things and has thought deeply, you know, about this path, you know, I understand it from both perspectives because I am that disruptor. I am the one that's been shaking up the status quo for a long time. But now that we've shaken things up, it's time to land it, you know. And so I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the experience because there's only... There's less than 30 days left in the election. I can tell you the system is completely rigged. As you know, I think we all know yeah. this. Yeah. But it's very different to hear it from someone that can literally describe like the stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's it's wild. 
Um, but, uh, you know, it's a rigged game. But yeah. you can't rig a system well enough to prevent me from finding a way to beat it. I'm, hey, I'm, I mean, that's, that's what, if we're going to learn anything from startups and entrepreneurship, it's, it's you know, there's, there's a way to game every system. There's a cheat code somewhere. There's a hacker somewhere that's going to be able to do something, right? So, so going back to your software analogy, there's no such thing as launching a piece of software with zero bugs. That's just not, not never happens, right? So you find that and, and, and shake it up and, and uh, you know, change things up a little bit. And I think that's super important. I mean, so you, every, everything you talk about is very realistic and serious. And, and you, you came at this very professionally, right? Like it, this isn't like a BS Kanye posting on Twitter, I'm running for president kind of thing. You had campaign videos and policies and, and all of these um, very professional laid out plans and ideas, um, not again, trying to separate you from the, the goofballs who say I'm running for president because they want it, but I can, I 100% sure, and I saw some of it, you know, third party, that, that you weren't treated seriously, right? Like, can you give us some stories of, of you know, that's, that's the first step in the, uh, in the, you know, rigged system, right? Like the fact that it's, it's laughable, it's or laughed at, not laughable, but it's laughed at when any third party candidate tries to be taken seriously. Yeah, I mean, that's what the, the media does is they don't want to give you any attention and then their goal is to discredit you to a large extent, right? You know, especially uh, as the world or the country becomes more and more polarized, you know, the, 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 the rigging and the restrictions um, of giving you airtime, you know, disappears. Meaning that, you know, right now, candidates to run for president will spend one to $2 billion on the election. But if you are not getting any media or airtime to be comparable to them, that means an independent candidate would have to spend two to ten billion. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, I mean that—that's the first crazy, insane hurdle, right? Like we know from internet marketing, right, that people are drawn towards the familiar more than the the you know something that's brand new. And so, knowing somebody's face, knowing the name of a person, just, just being able to pay for marketing over and over and over again, even if you disagree with someone, you're more likely to pick them over somebody you don't know. So that in one, you know, is the first obvious hurdle, right? Um, maybe. Well, the debates, I mean, the debates are probably the most important thing for, you know, a candidate to, to have any chance at, at winning, right? The debate, well, the commission is controlled by the Democrats and Republicans. Literally, the, the two parties choose every person that goes on it, and they base it upon the polls. And so the polls are commissioned, you know, by them. Yeah. And they specifically, when, when, when the polls that, like, run these programs call you, for example, they say, who are you going to vote for? And if you said Brock Pierce, they'd say, well, that, that's not a choice. He, he's not part of the questions. It's, it's you're either vote, picking the Democrat or the Republican. And you're like, well, I'm voting for Brock Pierce. They say, oh, we're going to mark you down as undecided. So it's so rigged that when the polls are conducted, they don't even include the other candidates. So you need to get 15% of the poll to be included in the debates. But how can you get 15% of the polls if your name is not even included in the polls? Like, it, it's just layer on layer on layer of a system that has been entirely rigged. Uh, the last person to get into the debates was Ross Perot. Uh, the debates were run in 1992, which was the yeah. year by the Women's League of Voters. As soon as Ross Perot got on that stage, they stripped away the rights of the women and gave it to a Democrat and a Republican to control so that it could never happen again. Basically, anytime something disruptive happens, they patch the hole up and they make sure that it's sealed. Here's another one, and I don't really want to criticize. Um, I, I try not to be negative, but I, this is part of the story is just to show you some of the stuff. But Los Angeles, I set up a, a, a campaign headquarter there, and then they reinstituted the lockdown. And they decided that in the city of Los Angeles that campaigning is not considered an essential business. And so they outlawed democracy in the city of Los Angeles during an election year which what that does is it ensures all the incumbents get reelected. It's a really powerful thing to stop anyone from winning that is not already in office. In New York, 
So in eight, to get on the ballot in New York, you need 15,000 signatures or petitions. Mm-hmm. And so in the heart of COVID, as New York was getting hit harder than anywhere in the world in April, you'd think that they'd consider electronic signatures because you can't collect signatures. Maybe they'd lower the bar or maybe you're just so busy you do nothing. What did they do? They increased the number to 45,000 <laughs> to, to wipe out any candidate for being able to get on the ballot in New York. And then third parties, if they meet the requirements in the past elections, have the right to nominate you. And to make sure that none of the third parties would nominate anyone on the ballot in New York, the governor changed the rules there as well and said that if you nominate a presidential candidate in New York and that candidate doesn't get at least 2% of the vote, the party is forever disbanded. So they just basically went like, we're going to lose our party if we make a bet on some up and coming person that we're not sure about. And they no. made it that no one, that made everyone scared. I got endorsed. I am nominated by the Independence Party of New York. Um, uh, they call me Neo. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're like, you're the one we've been waiting for. You could actually, every decade, there's been one candidate that actually had the, the, the charisma, the skills, the this, the that. And Ross Perot was the one of the 90s. And the last two candidates were Bloomberg and Trump. They were running as independents. And then, you know, the parties convinced yeah. them to run under the party banner. And they're like, you, you're, you're, the, this, you're what we got for this decade. And so they, they had the faith to nominate me. And the good news is I'm polling 4 to 5% in New York right now. So uh, uh, the, the minimum threshold of 130,000 votes are looking okay. very good. I think it's, it's planting the seeds of actual democracy. Right. Like that's that's the thing that that has always driven me nuts because I, I've, you know, like I said, I was a punk rocker growing up. And when I was younger, I liked the idea of burning things down and all that stuff. But you don't understand the magnitude of what actual violence means and is when you're a teenager. Um, and then you grow up and growing up shouldn't mean indoctrinating yourself into the system. Growing up should mean growing up and understanding things more and maybe finding more peaceful ways of changing things or maybe more elegant ways of, of doing things. Or maybe if you're talking to an Israeli, bring that analogy up, other ways of doing things, you know? And, and I always joke that every time you talk to an Israeli, you go, no, 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 I'll take care of this video, go like this, right? So, so uh, you know, I, I, I love that because I, you know, like, like you said before, politics aside, the more people vote and the more people plant those seeds of independence, the less people hopefully feel like they have to pick one. I don't even think they're polar extremes. I think they make us think that they're polar extremes, um, but one side or another. There's not just two sides. So just, there is there are more opportunities. In I, I would I would make an argument that we only have one party. Yeah, you you very you very well can. And like I was joking before, I wasn't actually I wasn't joking. I had a shirt. When I was, you know, eight, 19 years old, I had the not my president shirt that had George Bush's face on it, right? I don't see much of a difference between any of the parties and who he was and what he represented, right? And at least being in the crypto space, I'll, I'll start looking at the banks and those, those groups. And the banks, uh, I think, are control more than any individual politician or any individual party, right? Um, because they pay for those to be there, those crazy rules and laws that allow corporate interests to, to pay for elections uh, essentially are, are creating this system. So, you know, we've got, we've got like a minute left and uh, I've probably talked too much. I, I like, I'd like to hear what you have to say, but closing remarks and, uh, you know, planting the seeds of, of, of change, right, is uh, uh, that's how I would almost... Uh, uh, summarize what you've been saying, right? Tell, give us, give us a close. You could go a little long because this is the last session of the day. Yeah, well, um, as someone that is involved in, you know, studying systems and system design, I think we really have to take a step back and ask, what are we incentivizing? You know, what is our goal in the United States? And I think a big part of our problem, and I don't want to blame any individual, is that we don't have a goal. We don't have a unified goal, a shared vision for our collective future. 
So how did we measure our success in the past? How have we historically measured and held our government to account? It's been by growth. The problem with growth is it is assumed that we had infinite resources. You know, if you didn't like what was going on, you moved west, you moved west, you moved west. Tell all the land has been consumed. And now that we can't keep just moving, you know, it's, it, and we're keep trying to grow, even though we've known for a while we don't have all those resources, it's creating lots of conflict. And so it's a big driver for conflict because our measurement of success, our mindset of success is just growth. I want more, 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 more. The other, other problem with growth is it doesn't differentiate or distinguish between positive and negative. Like getting the American people sick creates growth. Cancer creates growth. Locking people in prison creates growth. Forest fires in California create growth. Hurricanes create growth. All this stuff creates growth. But is that the kind of growth that we want? So I think we need to rethink how we measure our success and what we incentivize. The founders of this nation had a really incredible intention, which was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What if we started to measure our success by life? Did you know that life expectancy in the United States is in decline? What if we started to measure our success by life expectancy? You'd see different policy. You'd see a big impact in the private sector. The air, the water, the earth would get cleaner. We would get healthier because that's how we would measure and hold our government to account. Liberty. We're supposed to be the land of the free. But our privacy and our freedoms are under threat. We lock up more people in prison than anywhere in the world. It would be the end of victimless crimes. It would end the war on drugs. You know, all these sorts of things would happen if we started to measure our success by our freedom. And lastly, happiness. There are countries already around the world doing that. So I think we need to rethink the incentives, rethink how we measure our success and how we hold our government to account. This is one of the many things I talk about. If you'd like to learn more, you can find out more at brock.vote. I'm on all the, uh, the social media. I was in Puerto Rico this morning. I was in Taos this afternoon. I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico right now. I'll be in Colorado tomorrow night if you're around. Uh, I'm traveling with Brittany Kaiser, who many of you know is my campaign manager, Carla Ballard, I think some of you might know, who's my vice presidential running mate. And of course, Akon, who is my, uh, my chief strategist. That is the, uh, the face of the campaign. I'll be in the next few days in Utah, Idaho, Wyoming. Oh, come join us for the Independent National Convention, the INC in Wyoming. When October is that, 23rd. So we can share it with everyone. Yeah, October 23rd and 24th. It will be bigger than the DNC and the RNC combined in its first year. This is, you know, we're thinking big, we're thinking game changing. And again, I'd like to remind you if you feel like getting involved and you want to be a part of this movement, please join us. Oh, and it's worth noting that there is a possibility I could be president next year. The way it works is I don't have to win the election to become president. This shocks a lot of people. They're like, what? And I'm talking the top political experts because they're always like, Brock, why are you doing this? I explain the why. They're like, I love it. This is actually kind of what the country needs. But why now? What can you possibly accomplish in this short period of time? I go, well, did you know I don't have to win to be president? They're like, what? How does that work? I go, well, to win, you need to win a majority of the electoral college vote. The key word being majority, 270 electoral college votes or more. If the two major party candidates were to tie, it would be 269 to 269. This is what happened in the year 1800, Thomas Jefferson versus Aaron Burr. Or if a third party candidate such as myself were to win one state, or even to bring faith to the faithless and win electors. And if it were a close enough race, it's possible that no one wins. So what happens if no one wins the election? The top three candidates are given to the House of Representatives and not the Democratic House, but the House chooses the president. Each state gets one vote along with the District of Columbia. Whoever gets 26 votes first wins. If it were a split vote, where the Republicans don't have enough to get the incumbent in again, and the Democrats don't have enough to get the Democrat in, we may find ourselves in a gridlock. In January, Nancy Pelosi would become the interim or acting president. You know, it could get very interesting and it's conceivable 
that a compromise could be reached uh, for that third place candidate that is representing unity and love at a time where this nation is divided. And so when I explain this to the top people, they're like, who are you? How did you figure this out? They're like, Brock, it's not likely, but you actually just showed a path that's possible. You literally just showed me a path that's possible. You could end up being president. It's not likely, but it's possible. This is crazy. How did you figure this out? I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm that guy. I'm the guy, if anyone ever was going to pull off the greatest hack, <laughs> it, it, it would be someone like me. And that's that's right. So I think that's a great note to end on. I mean, uh, all that was going through my head at the very end was uh, that one, was it Dumb and Dumber, that stupid movie? Uh, so you're saying there's still a chance? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but really, that, that's the whole thing, is you have to plant seeds. And, uh, you know, that let's tie that back to the whole rest of the conference. This is the last session of the day. I want to thank everybody for coming. You, of course, Brock, for being here. You opened up our first show. This is the end of the first day of, of this show, um, and that was done on purpose. And, you know, this is an exciting time. We had thousands of people who not just joined us in the system today, but we streamed this live in a bunch of different places. It was streamed on Twitter, on Facebook, on Theta, on a bunch of our media partners, because we said, if this is going to be free, let's, let's have it everywhere. And we're, we, are, we know that tens of thousands of people saw the stream today, unique individuals. We're planting seeds for the future here too. And you know we're really, really excited in what's going on. So, Thank you so much, Brock. Thank you, everyone who's listening. We'll be back on bright and early tomorrow. Expect some recap emails from us and all the spam and all the fun stuff we're going to send your way. And we'll share some of those details of what Brock was just talking about with the convention and everything else. Um, that, you know, representing is super important and participating is super important. Otherwise, we really don't have much, you know, leg to stand on if complaining. So, Let's, uh, let's, let's all change the world. Thank you for joining us, Brock. And uh, New Mexico, I've got some stories about being a young punk in New Mexico, uh, spreading democracy, actually. I'm glad I didn't know you were there. We would have gone a whole different tangent. Um, we're gonna have to do that next time. Uh, all right, guys, thank you so much.